All right, we're a ninth lit, and we're beginning. Um, we're beginning the Henry V. And what I'm asking you to write up here: every Shakespeare play. Do you know how many there were? Remember how many there were? Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Um, everyone has five acts. Some modern plays have three, some two. Uh, AP Classic can really read a play that has just two modern. Um, and you know this, uh, we kind of followed this, that, those few minutes. I regret we didn't have more time when we were writing the Christmas story, but you, you learned this probably back in the, in grammar school. You probably re, re, uh, you know, re learned it back in dialectic, but basically a, a plot has these five elements and Shakespeare's plot can roughly, the acts um, are associated with each of these. So the first act is the exposition or introduction. The second act, the rising complication, rising action. Climax is usually in the third act. Falling in action and resolution in the fourth act. And the conclusion uh, in the last act. And it's not that simple, but that's, that's just generally something to anticipate. Like what we're going to find out in this first act uh, and it's it's fairly short, uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna be introduced to the problem. Bam! The the the, the play starts after the brief introduction by the chorus, and we're we're given the problem. Uh, and I can tell you, the problem is France, and so it's gonna be um, that's gonna be explained. You get all the details, and then as you read through, look for the problem getting worse. And then somewhere in the third act, something happens that kind of turns, now it's not over. Um, Agincourt doesn't take place till act four. And that's clearly the, the biggest part of the book. But, um, and so the story's not over and it doesn't even mean that the most exciting thing has happened yet because Agincourt is the most exciting thing. And the speech by Henry is probably the pinnacle of the story. But still, you'll look back in Act Three, and you can probably, most of his plays, you can find something. Like in, in Macbeth, Macbeth kills somebody because he became king. He murdered the king and became king, and then he has to kill people to stay king. And so he murdered one guy, but one got away in Act Three. And the guy that got away goes to England, gets an army, and comes back, and they end up retaking the throne of uh, Scotland and killing uh, Macbeth. That little thing, he got away, happens in Act 3. It doesn't always, I can't tell you that it would happen like that in every play, but that's just something to look for. So we are in the resolution part. Who would like to read the chorus? It, you know, we only have uh, so many, well, as far as I can remember, there are two women's parts in the whole play. So ladies, you're, you're welcome to join in, in here. Um, so why don't, uh, Lauren, would you like to do it? That's, that's a nice way to get voluntold, isn't it? Would you like to do it after I've asked you to do it? All right, we need two bishops. Um, why don't you be a bishop, um, Mallory, and why don't you be a bishop, Jude? Uh, you, can be, you can be Canterbury, and Jude, you can be Elos. All right, we do need a Henry. Now, the other classes, uh, I think uh, Freddie would have, would would come in every period and read Henry, um, but we don't have Freddie in here, so we need somebody else to, to do it. No one's going to volunteer. I'm going to. It is Will. Will be Henry. Um, and you know, come to think of it, that's just about all we need. We do need an Exeter. So, Ian, why don't you read Exeter? You're not stuck with these parts. Uh, we need an ambassador. Um, I was looking at. I was looking at Zach and. And like I know, I'm looking at Zach, but saying Ian. But I, Ian, you'll still be the ambassador, right? Now you're Exeter. Who are you? Who did I just tell you to be? Uh, I'm Exeter. All right, so you can be the ambassador, Zach. And I think that'll get us through Act. Act one is really short, uh, relatively short. Uh, though, oh, uh, well, I don't have your book, but your notes. I don't have a single book. I can't really speak of this very well, but I think your book has notes on the left side and in the margins. If, if you're Zach and Will, 
the notes are in the left on the left hand side of the page. Mark, can I look at yours and see? Uh, yeah, look on the left hand side of every page. I think we can turn the page and see what that looks like. Yeah, okay, you're only going to read the right hand side of the page. The left hand side are notes and then they're margin notes. So I think the book is uh, would be worth having. So that's why I'm going to record it some more. So uh, anybody has questions? All right, well, let's begin. So we'll get the, uh, the uh, chorus, and I think you read every, in front of every act has a chorus. I think they're followed up. So you may begin. I just made an executive decision. Um, we're not going to do the rest of the vocabulary for Canterbury Tales. There are only 15 words. We're going to do these because it's realized the word puissance uh, appears more than once and it's the second word on your list. So before we go, I'll go ahead and assign these for next week to do maybe, uh, I mean, it's just homework assignment. We'll be here Monday. How about Tuesday? Um, I don't think there's anything else we're doing. Um, you do it Monday night if you have to. Is that, is that pretty good? Let me go ahead and, and do that. Instead of doing the Canterbury Tales, I think this is more helpful since you're going to be running into these words. Uh, we did the vocabulary. Four, aren't there? Let's see. Just 20. And we're talking about definitions and sentences. Uh, what is today? Today is Wednesday. Uh, yeah, just the first 20. All right, sorry. Let's go back. There are no questions for this, and yet I think it's really important. Let me let me tell you to put it at the top. You, the first thing you write in the book is the numbers 1415, 1450, because that's the date that the play takes place, 1415. I can't tell you that it's October yet. The Battle of Agincourt takes place October 25th. You're going to need to know that. 
So, I don't know how much time takes place between the beginning of the play and the battle. I imagine it's more than, you know, a month. So we're probably talking about late summer or something. I, I'll have to look. But anyway, that's when the play, the date is 1415. He just gave us a disclaimer. It's now it's hard to hear each other with these masks on, so please try to speak out. But did any of you hear the disclaimer? Do you remember the disclaimer that Chaucer gave us in the Canterbury Tales? Mallory, do you remember? I should have put that on the table. Do you remember the, the disclaimer? Remember the disclaimer was uh, <laughs> I had to I had to use a a bad word just the other day. Um, I try not to use them, but I was, uh, I was, I felt like it was important that I told this person exactly what was said, so I used a four-letter word because that's what the person said. Um, remember, a disclaimer is, I don't want to have to do this, but I got to, so I'm just warning you ahead of time. Any disclaimer is a warning. And this is not really a warning. It is, it is kind of a, a warning. Um, and here's the warning. How can we put, write, write this down somewhere, write it in your note. There's not a question, but I'm going to, how can we put one of the greatest battles in history, how can we reenact that on this little stage? You saw the stage yesterday. You looked at the, the drawing. How you, can you imagine having a, uh, a play about the Battle of Gettysburg? How about the Normandy invasion, the largest military operation in human history? How are you going to make a play out of that and show it on a stage about the size of this room? The, the fact is, you really can't do that, right? And so he's apologizing in advance. He says things like this. Look at line nine, and you do have line numbers. So we did, I don't think we had line numbers in anything else we've done. That's really helpful. It says, but pardon gentles all, the flat unraised spirits that has dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. See, that's the apology. Forgive us in advance for trying to recreate this huge event on this little stage. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden oath the very cast that did affright the air of Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest in a little place a million and let us ciphers in this great account on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdles of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies whose high upreared and abutting fronts uh, the perilous narrow parts asunder. So I'm apologizing. We're going to do Henry V on this little stage. This is what I need from you. What does he need from the audience? What do you think you would need to go in a building and look at a stage and believe that this building, uh, this, this stage is going to recreate the Battle of Agincourt? Read. Really? like you Right. Um, I, I think it's Coleridge who said this. Uh, suspension, he called it the suspension of disbelief. Do you know places and things where you go that you suspend disbelief? Like, this is not real, but I'm going to pretend that it is real. What about every time you go to a movie? Remember those? Remember the last time you went in a movie theater and sat down and there was a big screen and there was a a movie up there. Is the movie real? Why did you get scared then when the guy pops out with the axe, you know, getting ready to, why did it scare you? The movie's not real. So what are you doing? You're suspending your disbelief. You know it's not real. There's this big flat canvas there and it's just pictures on a screen. And yet you're, you know, it's like you just, you become part of it and it's like it's real. And when it's over, you come out and you, you feel like you've been somewhere. That's what he's asking. It's you, what you do every time you read a book. It's, it's every time you watch a, a movie or something. Um, 
you're suspending your disbelief and he's asking you to do that he's saying help us use your imagination um, when we say you know there are a million people here that is when there's one guy on stage that guy might represent a thousand or when there's one cannon on stage by the way they did have cannon in 1450 um, imagine 50 cannon so that's that's kind of what he's talking about um, so oh not only space what's the other time you have to suspend your disbelief in it usually goes with space you got blank in space time and space so he says you know this might have taken three months we're going to do it in five minutes so you have to imagine that what just you know between this scene and the last scene three weeks went by or a year went by uh, you know it just five minutes it was just five minutes ago but you got to pretend that it was a year ago so anyway that's the uh, the power of the imagination so we're going into act one this is scene one we got our two bishops um, my, my copy I'll just read what it says I don't know if your copy says this on the left hand side I have a summary I'm going to read you the summary of act one scene one the Bishop Canterbury informs the Bishop of Eli of a bill threatening the church revenues and of a plan to postpone it by justifying King Henry's invasion of France to claim the French throne. Canterbury also reports his offer of a most generous contribution to the king to help finance the war. These two men of, of God, supposedly, are trying to figure out a way to encourage Henry to fight France. These guys want war. You'd think a, a, a religious person would not want war, right? Because war, in, in, in many respects, is immoral. I mean, sometimes it, it, you gotta fight back sometimes. That's not immoral, to defend yourself. But they, they want Henry to attack France because if they're going to be charged a tax, they're gonna be taxed and they don't want to pay that tax. And they figure if we can just divert his attention to fighting France, and we'll give him a big contribution, which would be a lot less than what we would be taxed, um, I think we can get, get away with this. So that's the first example of corruption in war. These men are very corrupt. They're willing for hundreds and hundreds of French and English people to die so they won't lose some fields and, and money and so forth. So, that's what they're talking about. We'll start with uh, Canterbury and then go to Eli. My Lord, I'll tell you, I saw Philip Birch, the king of Lovers here, the last king's reign was right. And had indeed been such time. Philip Birch was a king who had been in a quiet time and did such an hour of hard work. But how, my Lord, shall we resist it now? It must be so. <clears throat> Sure. 
Let's pause. All right, let's look at the first one. We've only got one question here. They are discussing what I just explained to you. It says, examine the dialogue between the bishops. What is their opinion of Henry V? How did he gain wisdom and vast knowledge? Well, they, they left out the part that, that I told you. That would be in question three. So let's look at question three. What is the bishop of Canterbury's plan to get Henry to block the tax bill that would harm the church? And I'll go ahead and tell you the answer. We'll see it. The plan is to encourage him to go to war, to distract him from taxing the church. And plus, they're going to give a big contribution to the war effort, but it's still cheaper than what they would lose in the tax plan. That's, that's why they're... That's why they're here talking. <clears throat> well, let's go back to one after you write that. Okay, what's their opinion of Henry the Fifth? Listen, I'll, I'll reread part of that. Uh, he said in line 26, <clears throat> the courses of his use promised it not. Let me back up. Uh, 24, the king is full of grace and fair regard. That, that answers the question. They think he's full of grace and fair regard. But he goes on to say that when he was a kid about your age, talking about the men, the young men in this room, and a little old, I don't know what age he was when he became king, but it didn't look like he was going to be a very good king. That's because he was a party animal. If you want to read about that, you can read Henry IV, part one and part two. He wasn't a very good, he was kind of like a, uh, uh, Harry, you know, Prince Harry. Wasn't he the, of the two, wasn't he the one who was kind of the wilder one of the two? And he married, is it Meghan Markle, is that her name? Do you keep up with this stuff? They're, they're not even in part of the family anymore. I think they live in America now, or at least Canada. They, they, just, they just say, we don't want this anymore. Uh, his brother's going to be king after his father's king, after his grandmother is king. But uh, I think Harry had a reputation to be a, a wild child, you know, party animal type thing. Well, that was Henry V. That was his, and, and his name was, they called him Prince Hal, H-A-L. When you read, if you ever read those two books, he goes by the name Hal. I guess it's a nickname for Henry. So he was a wild kid, and everybody was worried about it. Well, his father died just like that. He said he changed. And nobody can quite figure it out. Okay, like his father died yesterday, and here he comes, he walks in, now he's king, and he acts like a completely different person. And they can't figure it out. Um, and they, they say that at the bottom of the page. They say he can talk about all kinds of things, divinity, he can debate the commonwealth affairs, so he can d debate politics, he can debate the Bible, he can debate war strategies, they can't figure it out. You know what a Gordian knot is? It says that turn him to any cause of policy, the Gordian knot of it, he will unloose. Yes. Yes, because who did? Who did that? Who is what's who the famous person was involved in? Will might know, but do you know Will? Alexander. Right. He couldn't. He couldn't figure out how to. Nobody could figure out how to untie the knot. So he just pulled out a sword and cut it. And so a Gordian knot is a solution that is a problem. The only solution is outside the box. And so nobody can figure out how he became so smart. Um, I think he's going to talk about it here in a minute. Well, I think, I don't know if it, they, they just imply it. Let me see. Well, let me put it this way. When I, was at, when I was at Carolina, there was a 
bar downtown. I, I'm honest with you, I never, never went there, but it was called the library. That's real clever, isn't it? So, you know, the, they, the parents called and say, what'd you do tonight, son? He said, I went to the library. Ha ha, you know, the, the, that's the name of the bar. Um, Henry did it the other way around. Henry did go to the bar, but on the side, everybody knew that. What they didn't know, that on the side at night and other times, he was studying his head off. It's kind of the opposite of your typical stereotype of a teenager who's pretending to study, but instead he's partying. Well, Henry sort of pretended to party, and instead he was studying. Um, anyway, that's that's where we go next with the Bishop of Eli. He's going to use, look at question number two. He's going to use a metaphor to describe Henry. So, Eli? Uh, the strong and gross underneath the nettle and wholesome various thrive and ripen that never by fruit of faith or quality and so the prince obscured his contemplation under the veil of wildness, which no doubt grew like the summer grass that suspend on unseen yet creases and and that's what we've been saying about Shakespeare's language. The word crescive, C-R-E-S-I-V-E, -E, it means growing. You want to improve your vocabulary? Spend this summer reading two or three of his plays. And then look up some of the words you don't know. You'll come back as a, you'll be like Henry V. I can't believe that's, that's Jude, that's Zach, you know? They, did, they were studying all summer. They come back and they like, they're, they're telling us all this stuff. Um, what's the metaphor? Yeah, Will. Um, it's like a strawberry that grows in the midst of thorns. Right. It says, Henry was the strawberry that grew underneath nettle or next to, to you know, uh, thorns um, of lesser quality. I don't believe that. The, the Bible says that he who walks with wise men becomes wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. I think that's the rare exception of somebody who hangs out with people that are fools and he becomes wise. You're going to become like the people you hang out with. 90% of the time, Henry's an exception, I guess. But 90% of the time, you, we want to figure out what kind of person you're going to be. Let's look at the people you hang out with. That'll tell you about everything about who you will become because you're going to, you're going to act like them. You're going to, you're going to think like them. Um, and I think if you have on the other side good friends, they're wise, they're good people, they, you know, I think we could say, well, that explains it right there. Look at the people they hang out with. Those are the, that explains why this person is that way. Um, so anyway, Canterbury. It must be so for miracles are ceased, and therefore we must needs exist and needs helping the perfection. So my All right, so um, he, he said he was talking to Henry about 
the plan. Remember I told you what the plan is? What's the plan? The plan to keep the church from being taxed. He's going to encourage him. And that discussion he was having with Henry when the ambassador to France showed up. So he couldn't continue the conversation. So we're going to see now Henry... Remember, kings never... They never... Um, they, you'll see it happen in this play one time, but kings never walk by themselves. You know, it's like... Think of the most popular person in school. I'm sure all of you would fit that clock characteristic. But I can remember in other schools... The most popular person in school, they had like an entourage. You know, just followed them everywhere they went. You know, that's the king. king never goes anywhere by himself. He always has a bunch of people. So look at all the people that are with him. It says, enter the king, the Duke of Gloucester, Bedford, Clarence, Warwick, Westmoreland, Exeter, six or seven people. And so we will be introduced now to King Henry. And uh, they'll continue this conversation about France. So we'll... Where is my gracious word? Exeter, that would be Zach, or who was it? Mm -hmm. I am. He's Exeter. Mm -hmm. All right, Henry. Uh, Shall we call in the ambassador, my liege? Okay, and you have to w- look at the, the stage directions because the two bishops, Canterbury and Eli, walk back in and uh, Canterbury begins. Thank you. Before um, she reads, look at question number four. Um, why does Henry call, refer to we instead of I? He says, sure, we thank you. My learned Lord, we pray you to proceed and so forth. Why, why does he use the we? Are you talking about like him and God? Well, that's a, that's a that's a pretty good guess. Um, I'm not sure that's exactly what it what he had in mind, but I, that's I like that. It actually, it could be. Any other suggestions? The the king when he says we, he's really talking about he represents all of England. The king of England, kind of like the president, whoever it is of the United States, he kind of represents everybody, or should, and so the. He's, that's when he says, we pray to you. It's uh, the royal we, I guess you could call it. Uh, sometimes it's the royal third person. You know, if you're a king, you refer to you know, yourself as in the plural. Um, so what is he asking? Let me see. Um, yeah, look at question five. In Henry V's first speech, he cautions the bishop to be honest, direct, and accurate in his discussion of Henry V's ties to the French throne. What qualities of Henry's personality and leadership can you glean from his words? So he said, you're, you're trying to encourage me to go to war. What happens when you go to war? People get killed. 
So be very careful what you tell me because I'm going to base my decision on your advice. And if you advise me to do something that's not right, then, you know, the blood is on your hands in, in a way. So that's why he said, be very careful. Uh, he says that, for God doth know how, how many now in health shall drop their blood in approbation of what your reverence shall incite us to. Um, so be careful what you say to me. Now what does that say about Henry? He says he, he doesn't want to go to war for the wrong reasons. And if you're telling me something that's not true, and I go to war, I don't want to be wrong about that. Because people will die. Well, yes, that's that's absolutely true. <coughs> he cares how he looks, but um, and he wants to do the right thing for whatever his motive is. He doesn't want to fight for the wrong reason. So, Canterbury, you have a quite a bit here to read, but I think yeah, I know you can handle it. <coughs> um, before you before you go on, turn back to line uh, 10, 11, 12, 13. Sign line thirteen on page nineteen. What? I'm glad you're paying attention there. Yeah. You, know, you have an identity crisis today. Who am I? Uh, you're not cannabis. But you are on page 19. Find it. Uh, I'm sorry. No, it's not page 19. I, I, you're not in the same book. But it's line 13. So whatever page that is. <coughs> Circle the word salic. S-A-L-I-C. Circle that. Find it. The line is the same, it's just not the page number. It is for Zach and Will. Anybody find that? King Henry Wright, as he begins in line 10 to talk to Canterbury, he, he said, why the lost salad? Anybody got that? All right, so now we're going to hear about this salad law. She's going to let her read it. <coughs> and then there's a lot here you don't need to, re to really understand. It's a lot of detail, but uh, we want to get the main idea. So, Canterbury. Then hear me, gracious sovereign, and pretend you hear that of yourself your life and services to this imperial church. There is no bar to make against her highness the highness of the claims of France, the first which they produced from Paramount. In Paramount, thou gone, Mugliere, me, the stuffy dog. Pause. Who is Charles the Great? Charles. Charlemagne. So you've read about him and um, saw Roland and you've studied him in, in history. Before you go on, let me tell you what the Salic Law is. The Salic Law says that in France, you cannot become king through your mother's side of the family. So in order to be eligible to be king, your daddy or your great-granddaddy or your great-great-granddaddy had to be king. Now, now, I'm getting confused a little bit, too, because your daddy has to be king, but your daddy, anyway, it's, if, you, if you think you're 
to be, if you think you deserve to be king because you're related to the queen, then that doesn't apply. You have to, it has to be a male, it has to come from a male. And his argument is, the Canterbury, is that Sally is in Germany. It's not even in France. That doesn't at all apply to France. Even though they have applied it to France, it shouldn't. And so you're going to hear a lot of names you recognize, I hope, but you don't have to really understand all this, but if you'll read that. Um. Besides their writers say, King Pepin, which the church till there, did as heir general gain the All right, so all you need to remember, the Salic law prohibits uh, someone or man in France to, of becoming king through his mother's side of the family. And that's the reason Henry thinks he should be king. Because you have to pick the person, like the next person in line. And according to Henry, or according to the bishops, that would have been Henry. Except it's through his his mother's side of the family, and that's why it's prohibited. Can you think? It, can you think of a, a a queen of France that ruled? I know you haven't studied a lot of French history. Can you think of any queen? Like we have Queen Elizabeth, Queen Victoria, in England. Can, can you think of any queen, ruling queen? I'm not talking about the the wife of a king is also called a queen. Can you think of anybody? Yeah. Was that? Mary Antoinette. I, did she rule as queen? And what? Yeah, I thought her husband was killed first, and then she was killed. So for the three times, when the, when the husband was killed, then she. So she she actually ruled. Yeah, I guess. Okay, I, I don't know that either because I, other than her, I can't think of any. So England England had their queens, but not France. Anyway, that's his argument. We'll go to Henry. Will. I was right in conscience to make this claim. The sin upon my head dread sovereign. For in the book of Numbers it is written, when the man dies, let him appear to him to send up to the daughter. Gracious Lord, stand for your own, unwind your bloody flag. Look back into your mighty ancestor. Go, my dread Lord, to your great grandsire's tomb, from whom you drank. Unvoke his warlike spirit in your great armpit, Edward the Black Prince, who on the French ground heard the tribe. That's probably good. I, uh, we're going to get caught here. So I'm, I'm writing down where we finish. So make a note of that. Um, tomorrow we'll talk about Edward the Third and Edward the Black Prince.
Um, these were his ancestors. So we'll we'll look at them. All right, we will see you tomorrow.